he had also said that when you hear publicly people are saying that i am an incarnation of god you will know this my my leela divine plays at an end um so one day when he had the cancer of the, of the, of the throat and um, he was shifted to kashipur so we know the 1st of january 1886 how that became the kalpataru day it's a famous it's a big religious festival in india now especially in calcutta millions of people go, go to these places now um so in kashipur sri ramakrishna was there suffering from throat cancer the same year he would pass away a few months later that day he was feeling well 1st january he comes downstairs and walks down with the company of devotees girish ghosh is there so sri ramakrishna sees him and he says well girish what have you seen in this that you go around saying all such things you know things like that he is an incarnation of god girish ghosh overcome with emotion with a choking voice bows down falls at his feet and he says he whose glory vyasa and valmiki the composers of ramayana and mahabharata and the puranas they could they could not describe your glories what can i say that means you are the lord your uh, himself you, you are the incarnation avatar of the lord sri ramakrishna hearing this goes into ecstasy and he blesses girish ghosh may you be illumined chaitanya hok what else shall i say to you may you be illumined and at his touch and his blessing the people who were around him they started experiencing deep spiritual states the 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 form of god they had been worshiping ishta devata which month years and years they have been meditating upon they have a vision of god in the in the way they wanted to see god some go into deep meditation into samadhi some stand there with tears pouring down their cheeks some dance some start reciting hymns some shower him with flowers and he goes around touching everybody and saying chaitanya ho be illumined and uh, some start shouting come come whoever you are nearby so later this was called kalpataru the wish fulfilling tree uh, but the trigger was girish ghosh people who were interviewed later what did you see and they gave these extraordinary descriptions vaikuntha nath sanyal many decades later he says that day when sri ramakrishna touched me and said may you be illumined i saw sri ramakrishna himself uh, from the sky to the earth everywhere i saw i saw the blissful smiling form of sri ramakrishna and my heart over it would as if it would burst with bliss he said it lasted 3 days day and night and till he he said that i got scared how will my business go on how will i take care of my family and in in he, a kind of holy terror seized him he rushed to his shrine the picture of sri ramakrishna was there and sri ramakrishna was living at that time it was just 3 days after the kalpataru and in the shrine he said what you have given please take it back <coughs> immediately that real that experience went away and vaikuntanath channel decades later he says why did i pray that years later i just got this old life back again at the worst what could have happened i would have gone mad maybe maybe i would have died so what <laughs> so and he says now i live with the memory of those three days i just recall that and that gives me peace but this was just his experience there were many others and they got different experiences but all divine and very uplifting and completely life changing girish ghosh was the trigger the arrangement was that the young disciples the boys who later became the monks of the order here they would look after sri ramakrishna nurse him and the expenses would be paid by the householder devotees the rent and the money for the food and medicines everything doctor and after some time some of the householder devotees they accused the boys of overspending so they looked at the accounts book and they said you are spending extravagantly and this is you, you should be more careful and they uh, were will not people to take it lying down so it a quarrel developed between the two groups girish ghosh watched it quietly he got up typical girish ghosh he snatched the account book set it on fire and tossed it aside and he said from now on whatever is uh, one money is required i will give it how will you give all this money he said if required i will sell my house but i i, I will um, i will serve sri ramakrishna with every bit of my money my property of course everybody gathered around and he didn't have to do that but that was girish ghosh swami advaitananda at that time budogopal maharaj so he was 
a monk. He was actually the one, the one disciple of Sri Ramakrishna who was older than Sri Ramakrishna. Now he wanted to do a typically Hindu merit, uh, pious thing. There's a pilgrimage called Ganga Sagar. Even now it's there. It's, it's, it, I mean, what do I mean even now? It's enormously popular now. Millions of people go there. So that's the confluence of the river Ganga with the Bay of Bengal, where the river flows into the delta, into the ocean. So that's regarded as a holy place. Almost everything is a, is a holy place for, for Hindus. So the source of the Ganga is holy, and the confluence of the Ganga with the, with the sea is holy, and the Ganga itself is holy also. <laughs> I remember I had gone to the source of the Ganga, the, the glacier where it comes. The last inhabited village there, in the high up in the mountains, in the, in the Himalayas. So the mountain folk who are very, um, very de devout people. We are interested in where the Ganga comes from. The mighty Himalayas and Gangotri and all. They are interested where it goes to. Because they see it all the time. It's just a glacier for them. So when they know, I knew that I have come from Bengal, from Calcutta, where our monastery is. Said, oh, you have come from the place where Ganga Sagar is. How, how wide is the Ganga there? For them, it's a narrow mountain river, fast flowing. But in Calcutta, it's vast. It's something like the, wider than this. Um, so, when I describe that, they look at it with you know, wide eyes. They listen, look, listen to it with wide eyes. And they said, we, it's our dream to go there, to, to see that. And I said, all right. But they're very simple people. And they're all accustomed to high mountains. I said, but Calcutta is 105 in the shade and 100 degrees uh, and 100% and, and humidity most of the time. So, so I said, you should go in, in the winter. Don't go in summer. You'll melt. So they said, yes, we know because we went to Uttarkashi and it was so hot. Uttarkashi is 5,000 feet, in, uh, 6,000 feet in, <laughs> in altitude. And they found it unbearably hot. <laughs> So, one thing that the Hindus do is, the, lots of monks come to the Ganga Sagar, to that pilgrimage. And one pious thing is to give them something. So like clothes, what they need, clothes. Monks don't need much. The clothes, and that's only one style they have. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> no variety. Um, they might need shoes. Um, I remember seeing a shop for monks. The shopping mall, not a mall, it's just a shop. It's called the uh, Gupt Baba Ka Dukan. The, <laughs> the, the little secret shop for monks. It's secret because you can't find it unless it's, it's like a magic shop. Now what's the magic about it? Everything is free. Everything is free, whatever you want. But whatever you want is, you can have this cloth. And you can have a pair of shoe, uh, shoes or sandals. You can have a Gita and a blanket to cover yourself with. And, and I think a cap. That's the set. So that, that's the range of cho choices. And it miraculously it opens only when a monk is around. Otherwise, it's always closed. <laughs> so uh, Advaita Ananda wanted to give this to the monks there. He got these uh, clothes and he dipped them in the dye. And he wanted to give it to monks. He said to Sri Ramakrishna, this is what I want to do. Sri Ramakrishna said, look at these young boys. Uh, where will you find better monks than, you know, Narain and Rakhal and others? Give it to them. That's the highest merit. So he decided to do that. He made 12 sets of rosaries and cloth. And Sri Ramakrishna himself distributed it to 11 of the young people who were present at that time. And the 12th one, he said, set it aside and give it to Girish. Which is a tremendous thing of all the devotees who were there. He selected Girish. And Girish who's sort of, it haunted him that he couldn't be a monk. And Sri Ramakrishna said, give it to Girish. And we say we are, all, we are a monastic order descended from Sri Ramakrishna in that sense because he gave the, the ochre robe to our founders, Vivekananda and others. But equally he gave the ochre robe to Girish also. Later it was given to Girish when he came to visit and very reverentially he sort of, he touched it to his head. Even when Sri Ramakrishna passed away, Girish Ghosh, uh, he wouldn't visit too much because he didn't like to see Sri Ramakrishna ill. And even when Sri Ramakrishna passed away, he didn't believe that he had passed away. 
He said it's just the divine play of the master. He's always there. Uh, he cannot die. He's immortal. He had asked, once Sri Ramakrishna had scolded him a little. He said, in Bengali, Tomar mone kache. There's a, this crookedness in your heart. And Girish Kosh writes, I knew that. <laughs> it's no news to me. It's, uh, my heart is full of crookedness. <laughs> but then he says to Sri Ramakrishna, how will it go? How can I get rid of it? Sri Ramakrishna said, look, a bowl in which garlic has been kept, it, has, it retains the smell no matter how much you wa wash it. And then Girish Ghosh understood what was meant. And he said, how will the smell go? Will it never go? Sri Ramakrishna says, yes, it can go. If you burn it in fire, it goes away. The smell goes away. And Girish Ghosh was literally burnt in the fire after that. Literally in the sense of suffering, the worldly suffering. He had lost his wife when he was quite young. He had remarried. He lost his second wife. He lost two of his daughters. And his youngest son, who was very devoted to the Holy Mother, they all died one after another. And a kind of sorrow raged within him. Notice, in these cases, this, the sorrow, the worldly suffering, makes them more intensely focused on God. There's a difference between the conventionally religious and the truly spiritual. The more a spiritual person suffers, the more he or she catches on, or holds on to God. In the other case, what might happen is, I prayed so much, I hear this all the time, I prayed so much to God, I, pray, I uh, did so much of worship, and now this thing happens to me, and now I don't believe in God anymore. So that's like, I'm using God to improve my life. God is a convenience, an appliance. And God didn't work. God didn't do what he was hired to do. So laid off. <laughs> fired. In the case of people like Girish Kosh, the entire life is for God. Not God for my life. My life for God. So when he went through all this terrible suffering, um, he, and at that time, Swami Niranjananandaji, he was always sort of encouraging him to become a monk. So he told Girish Kosh, Sri Ramakrishna gave you the ochre robe. He practically made you a monk. Come to the monastery and live with us. And Girish Kosh, always impulsive, he walks out of his house wearing only one cloth and he goes straight to the monastery and says, I will not go back to the house anymore. I'm a monk now. But then the brothers had to uh, convince him that, you know, Sri Ramakrishna wanted you to stay in the world and to do the theater and things like that. And so again, he goes back. But it haunted him throughout his life. He went and told the Holy Mother. He loved going to Jairambati. Um... We are singing that song, Jairam Bhatir Mati Chandana Shaman, the, 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 the soil of Jairam Bhati, place where Holy Mother was born, is as pure as the sandalwood. So Girish Ghosh would go there and loved staying with the, uh, in the company of the Holy Mother. The devotion he had for Sri Ramakrishna, he had the same for the, for the Holy Mother. That shows it was not a personal thing. It's not that he was just attracted to the personality or the charisma of Sri Ramakrishna. He had the equal devotion to the Holy Mother, which shows that he caught hold of an impersonal reality beyond the persons, an unchanging reality. With the Holy Mother, he had a deeper relationship. He writes that when I was a young boy, I had a terrible illness and people despaired of my survival. And in my delirium, I saw this divine feminine figure who came and blessed me and my fever left me. And when I saw the Holy Mother for the first time, I recognized it is you, Mother. You've been watching over me all my life. And the Holy Mother was so gracious to Girish. The little things, you know, in the little village there, a the backward village in those times, and somebody as a big man like Girish, who's a famous dramatist and a famous person from Calcutta, is visiting. Um, every day he would find something strange. His bed sheet would be new and washed and fresh. So how is this happening? When he was not there, the Holy Mother would take it away and wash it herself and put it back on his bed. So like that, she would take care of him. He wanted, he asked her that I want to become a monk. And the Holy Mother finally persuaded him that you don't have to become a monk. Keep on doing what you are doing. And she herself went to see some of his plays. So that sort of uh, assuaged him. He used to say, I have drunk so much wine that if you put the bottles one on top of the other, they will be higher than the Himalayas. <laughs> higher than Mount Everest. He said, higher than Mount Everest. 
once he had gone to Sri Ramakrishna, he had these impulses. He and two of his friends, tipsy, drunk, in the dead of the night, midnight, they turn up at Dakshini. Suddenly he thought, I, want, I must see Sri Ramakrishna. Midnight, two of his friends, three of them drunk, they stumbled into Sri Ramakrishna's room where everybody else in the temple is sleeping. And wonder of wonders, Sri Ramakrishna is there as if expecting them. As Girish stumbles into his room, Sri Ramakrishna advances, he says, takes hold of both my arms, both my hands, and bursts into song and dances. And Girish goes, thinks, here I am, my family look upon me with contempt. And this man, this person considered the holiest of persons, he loves me so much. Truly the savior of the fallen, Patito Pavan. This is Patito Pavan. And many such incidents. Sometimes he would, he would curse Sri Ramakrishna using abusive words to the horror of the devotees around. And Sri Ramakrishna would not mind. Somebody said to Sri Ramakrishna, the poison that you have given him, that is what he is serving you with. <laughs> this is the allusion to the story of Krishna and the serpent in Vrindavan. Um, the serpent was a poisonous serpent biting everybody. And the serpent said, the poison that, Lord, you have given me, that's the only thing I can give back to you. After Sri Ramakrishna passed away, Girish continued his career. If you see the descriptions, he was truly an extraordinary person. He would compose he, uh, creativity. Somebody said to him, you know, the conversations of the witches in Macbeth, that can't be translated properly into Bengali. And immediately sat, and, uh, sat down and did it. And he translated Macbeth into Bengali. And it was a stage two. Sister Devamata, who was Laura Glenn, who went from actually New York here. Um, what's the place where they have the ashram? The Anand ashram? Kwaset. So she went from there and she visited different places in India and she saw Girish Ghosh at close quarters. He says this great Bengali dramatist, um, he would dictate to three secretaries at once. He was so creative, three different plays, and he would dictate. And the secretaries could not keep up. They did not have time to use the, you know, they had quills in those days. There was no time to dip the quill in the ink and then write because uh, he would speak so fast. So they had to use pencils, and three of them at a the time, because three plays were going on. And he would walk back and forth and dictate. I have read in Napoleon's life that he had the power to do this. Multiple secretaries taking down uh, letters and notes and his um, uh, orders. So once a secretary taking down dictation asked him um, to repeat himself. I missed that. And Girish Ghosh angrily snapped at him, saying that, don't do that, you don't break my flow, just put dot, 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 and give it back to me later, I will fill it up. But just write it down what I say. Once, uh, Sister Devamata records, once, in one night he composed 26 songs for a play. Uh, another play, uh, one of his famous plays, um, she records it was composed in 28 hours, continuous labor. He worked at a stretch for 28 hours and completed that play. Prodigious energy. He would work in his office in a day job. Throughout the day, in the evening, he would go to the theater, uh, arrange, the stage the plays, act in them himself, and he would be back at home by 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the night, day after day, month after month, year after year, and be back to his job early in the morning next day. Uh, he would act in his plays too. He could immerse himself in... Um, in the character. So in one of the plays, there's a famous story of how he was uh, acting in one of his plays, and Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, the great reformer, educationist in Bengal, everybody in India knows his name in Bengal especially. So Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar had come to see the play. And Girish Ghosh was acting the man, uh, role of a man um, uh, abusing a woman. Uh, and he was doing it so convincingly that... Uh, Ishwachandra Vidyasagar, in fury, took out his shoe and threw it at the stage. <laughs> at Girish Ghosh. Uh, he was uh, so aggravated by this, this scene that he threw it at Girish Ghosh. And it struck him uh, while, he was, uh, while he was acting. And Girish Ghosh immediately picked up the shoe, which had fallen on the stage, and put it on his head and said, this is the greatest praise anybody could give me. <laughs> <laughs> he would get totally absorbed. But once sees how this very faculty helped him to become spiritual. 
what he would absorb, he would become that. Once he was writing a play about Mir Qasim, and you know, the story in Bengal of the Muslim ruler who was betrayed by his own people. It's a story of power struggles and treachery and war and all of that. He was writing that play, but he would immerse himself so much. And that really shook him up. He called Swami Saradananda, the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, said every day while I'm working on this play, every day you should come and speak to me of Sri Ramakrishna for half an hour. Because my mind becomes so, um, so disturbed by all these power struggles, treachery and... And even in my dreams, he says, the bearded face of Mir Qasim floats in my dreams, uh, in, in, in my face. Um, so he was like that, entirely absorbed in what he was doing. Nag Mahashai, the great devotee of Sri Ramakrishna, a great householder devotee, he said Girish is a Bhairav, is one of the, those fierce companions of Shiva. So he's a Bhairava for Sri Ramakrishna. Over the years, there are so many accounts of how he became completely transformed, uh, literally a, a saint. So many comparisons have been drawn in Bengal. The story of Jagai and Madhai is well known. The two villains who were transformed into say, uh, saints by the touch of Chaitanya, Sri Chaitanya. It's a famous thing, story known to, uh, at least to all Bengalis, that uh, these two were villains and they would never, they, were no, they scoffed at the devotees of Krishna. And they in fact threw stones at uh, Nityananda and Nityananda's, uh, he started bleeding. Sri Chaitanya comes and embraces Jagai and Madhai and, and then they reform, they, they become reformed. So the comparison is drawn that what Chaitanya did for Jagai and Madhai, uh, Sri Ramakrishna did for Girish. And Girish didn't like that comparison. <laughs> Who wants to be a villain? Once some of the monks they told Girish, they would tease him. They would, once they said, all these plays and this name and fame and the theater, it's just your desire, you're doing it for your own desire. And you say, I'm doing the work of Sri Ramakrishna. And of course, that was really Girish's own uh, inner feeling that he was doing it because Sri Ramakrishna asked him to do it. But they would tease him. And Girish would uh, fly into a mock rage and say, enough. Next life, I'm going to tell Sri Ramakrishna, next time I come as the hero and you guys will come as the villains. <laughs> I will be a monk in the next life and you, you guys be, be my, the villain in the next life. Sometimes Swami Vivekananda and others would go and visit Girish Ghosh and to provoke him, you would have to put him in the mood. If you just go and said, please tell us something uh, inspiring about Sri Ramakrishna, he would probably drive you out. But you would have to understand his psychology. So Vivekananda and the other monks, they would go to his house, <clears throat> and in the way of conversation, they would sort of um, imply a criticism of Sri Ramakrishna. And immediately, Girish Ghosh would stand up, his face flushed red, and launch into a defense of his beloved master, and give such an inspiring talk, like everybody's minds would be uplifted. Once Girish, Girish Ghosh loved Vivekananda. Vivekananda was much younger uh, than Girish Ghosh. Once when Vivekananda was back from the West, he was teaching his disciples, uh, I think it was in Belur Mat, Girish Ghosh comes to visit. And so Vivekananda is giving a talk on the Rig Veda, um, the most ancient of the Vedas. And when Girish Ghosh walks in, Vivekananda sort of teasingly says, you are not interested in philosophy, are you? You're just, you're just sentimental. Love God, worship God, that's all that you are interested in. And Girish Ghosh says, in this life, by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, I shall cross over the ocean of samsara. And my salutations to the Veda. And he picks up the Veda and he salutes it saying, I bow down to uh, Sri Ramakrishna in the form of the Rig Veda. And then he turns to uh, Swami Vivekananda. And he says, Swami, you have studied so much, so many books, but look at our country. And he draws a heart-wrenching picture of the miseries of people in India. The poverty, the illit um, the illiteracy, the superstition, the hunger, this, the sorrow of the masses, uh, of women particularly. And as he goes on speaking, he's doing it on purpose. Swami Vivekananda started weeping. His tears came, rolled down his cheeks and he quickly rushed out of the room um, to retire to his own room. And then Girish goes, turns to the Vivekananda's disciples who are sitting around. You see, this is why I love your Vivekananda. 
not because of his great knowledge and his uh, you know the way he teaches and all, because of his great heart did you see a, a description of the sorrows of people immediately he melts in tears end of his life he kept on working his plays um even when he was ill he would say that this body is sri ramakrishna's body as long as he wants it uh, it will stay and when he does not want it will go one day he says to m the writer of the gospel author of the gospel he's sitting there next to m and he says old age has come death is coming i wonder what will happen to me at uh, after death at death after death and the next moment he says to m please beat me with your shoe i really mean it beat me with your shoe and m says why ever would i beat you with my shoe because i forgot sri ramakrishna is ever shining in my heart why should i be worried about what will happen to me after death so that was his attitude um once he was uh, ill with pneumonia he got wet in the uh, rain he but still insisted on going to the theater because he was acting in one of the plays and he said so many people will want to see me and uh, he and a number of scenes in that play required him to come bare chested on on the stage so the fever and cold became worse he was bedridden the day he passed away that was in february 12th 8, 1912 february 8 1912 the description is he is lying there in bed and the last words suddenly his eyes fly open and he says master you have come you have come destroy this delusion of my delusion of the world the worldliness the delusion of worldliness i have destroy that victory unto sri ramakrishna jai sri ramakrishna let's go he says clearly he said let's go and then he passes away one of his biographers says he's like a ever the dramatist he made a dramatic exit from the stage of the world <laughs> so in this mirror of girish ghosh we see the divine figure of sri ramakrishna i will tell you i love vedanta the path of the upanishads of non duality but there is a deeper mystery here when jesus says none shall come unto the lord except through me often people interpret it in a narrow exclusive way that means only through jesus but there's a meaning there what he means there is through the incarnation none comes to the father except through the son it does not mean that you have to believe in the incarnation and take refuge otherwise you cannot realize god no that's also not necessary ultimately you can realize god through the path of knowledge also through samadhi and path of meditation also but it's much easier it's much easier do you want to take the scenic route or do you want to get to the de- destination the scenic route takes you through many lives but taking refuge in the incarnation the result is the incarnation takes control charge of your life is a secret i'll leave you with this overcoming our passions and desires this is what girish ghosh showed to the nth degree overcoming our passions and de- desires is essential in spiritual life the struggle with greed and anger and lust and envy this is what blocks us otherwise god realization is very easy actually what is a saint we are all one with god the saint is one with god but so are you and so am i but the difference is a veil is over our eyes the veil of our own greed and lust and anger and envy all the negativities now one way is the way of the hero the yogi the saint is to fight with this why doesn't god remove it i found in one place that god wants you to have the joy of struggling with it and overcoming it in this very life itself that's true that's a great thing but there's another way we are most of us we are very ordinary folk how do we know if in our day to day life we are far more ordinary than say girish ghosh then in spiritual life too we are like that we have to admit and the second way is if you take refuge in the divine mother if you take refuge in sri ramakrishna and pray with a sincere heart o oh lord remove these dosha defects from my heart let me have a pure mind let me see thee let me feel thy presence the lord actually does it this is second path 
It's not the lifelong great struggle of the yogi. That has to be done. We must try it. But this is the path of surrender to God. In the beginning of Ram Nam, there is Kamadi Dosha Rahitam Kurumanasam. O Lord, please cleanse my heart of the dosha, the defects of lust and adi means etc. That means anger and greed and jealousy and envy. Cleanse my heart of that. With a cleansed mirror, Swami Vivekananda says the only thing that we can do is polish the mirror. If you cannot polish it, let the Lord polish it for you. <laughs> I have heard from people who have experienced it. Lifelong struggle with these passions. And the day you surrender to the Lord, I can't do it. But I really want to come overcome this. The next day, the instantly almost. I've heard it from, from monks. It's gone. It's no longer that you, there's a temptation, you have to struggle against it and overcome it, or there's an anger, you have to somehow control it, that you're now able to control it. No, no, not even that. That, that, that impulse, that rage, or the anger, or the lust, or the greed, that itself goes away, just goes away. It's like magic, it's gone forever, and you are at peace. So that's another way. That's what the incarnation can do for you, when he takes charge. Many people say the lesson to be learned from Girisha's life is that uh, a power of attorney. But that's a very high thing. What I find the lesson is, what one of the first things that Sri Ramakrishna told him, if you want peace, not in the deepest cave of the highest mountain, but in faith. That's a great secret which we can all, all uh, take ad advantage of. Bishash, in, in faith. If you start with faith, hold on, it, hold on with faith like Girish, with a fraction of his faith, it will start working miracles in our lives.